Audio Learning present Professor Sir Francis Knowles of King's College London and Professor J.M. Dodd, Professor of Zoology at the University College of North Wales at Bangor, who will discuss endocrine organs and their relation to the nervous system. Professor Sir Francis Knowles will speak first. Let's start by talking a little bit about how each of us got into the field of endocrinology because this may help to explain why later on each of us may take up slightly different positions when we discuss neuroendocrine control. For I think it'd be fair to say that you are primarily concerned with the endocrine system as such and I with the links between the nervous and endocrine systems. That's a good idea. Let's start at the beginning. I believe you first became interested in endocrinology at Oxford, didn't you, Francis? Well, actually, Jimmy, I'd say I was interested in it before I went to Oxford, because my inspiration, in a sense, was the book The Science of Life by Wells, Huxley and Wells, which I read at school. I remember that book very well. It played an important part in stimulating my interest in biology, too. I remember how I was fascinated by the work on amphibian metamorphosis, how it's been shown that if you took out the thyroid land of tadpoles, they never changed into frogs, but became huge tadpoles. Or alternatively, if you fed sheep's thyroid, I think it was, to little tadpoles, they became rather small frogs, much more rapidly than they otherwise would have done. Huxley was very interested in this particular thing because, as far as I remember, he did some of the original work himself. Yes, he did, but the pioneer work, which was, by the way, a landmark in the history of comparative endocrinology, was done by a man called Goudenach as long ago as 1912. He was primarily interested in how tadpole growth is affected by the food they eat, and he accidentally discovered that if he fed them thyroid tissue, it produced not growth, but metamorphosis in tadpoles of virtually all ages. Comparative endocrinology springs from this discovery, for until then, very little endocrine research had been done, and this had been restricted to the mammals. My general interest in endocrinology dates from immediately post-war when I went to join the Department of Zoology in the University of Aberdeen. That was after your degree at Liverpool? Yes, and also after a short period as a school teacher and five and a half years navigating in the Royal Air Force. So I went to Aberdeen with a more or less open mind so far as research was concerned. And I found there a very active endocrine group which had been started by Lancelot Hogburn. It was largely based on the South African clawed toad, Xenopus, which I believe is now well known in schools because Nuffield Biology has rediscovered it and developed quite a lot of its biological aspects for use in schools. I became interested in amphibian metamorphosis. This was in 1946. My serious research started like you after I'd finished my university zoology course at Oxford. I went to Naples just before the war. It was an Oxford scholarship to Naples, and there I started working on the pituitary of lampreys. For at that time, there was a great deal of work going on in the pituitary, but it was mostly in mammals, which seemed to me to be appallingly complex. I thought one might look at a very simple animal at the other end of the evolutionary scale and see if one could see the same features in a simpler form, like the pituitary control of reproduction, for example. I hoped one might find some endocrine activity rather more clearly expressed in a simple animal than in a complex animal. I think both of us have this idea as comparative endocrinologists, don't we? We do, and comparative aspects are something in which we're both interested, and it's always intrigued me to know how these complicated endocrine systems have evolved, an aspect which is proving very difficult to unravel because, of course, there are no physiological fossils. I'm also interested to discover whether hormones have changed in the biochemical sense during evolution and whether the uses to which they've been put have changed. Do you think, actually, by looking at simpler animals, one does really see the endocrine system in a simpler form? Not necessarily, because what is already clear is that all living vertebrates have well-developed endocrine systems. And, in fact, the lower vertebrates have almost exactly the same complement of glands as the mammals, plus, indeed, a few not found in mammals. And so one would presume that these glands must have existed for a very long time. For example, the lampreys you were talking about and their progenitors are known to have existed for at least 500 million years. And their complement of endocrine organs, even if these didn't look exactly the same as they now look and perhaps didn't do exactly the same things, must have had a similarly long evolutionary history.
one looks at a picture of the endocrine glands of man, one must say that these are the endocrine glands that one finds in some form or other right through the vertebrate series. Well, this is absolutely true, and they also retain a degree of basic structural similarity throughout the vertebrates, which is really quite remarkable. I think now it would be true to say, wouldn't it, Jimmy, that you are really interested in the endocrine system as an organisation in itself to some extent independent from the nervous system. Is that an oversimplification? No, this is certainly at least where I started and where many endocrinologists started by thinking that on the one hand we have a slow coordinating system which is the endocrine system and on the other hand a fast coordinating system which is the nervous system. But I think one of the things that will come out of our talk is that in fact there are no such clear distinctions. Yes, I became very aware of this at Naples. I went out there to study the pituitaries of lampreys, and I met an American biologist called Kleinholz who'd been working on crustaceans. At that time, we were just beginning to be aware that invertebrates also had endocrine systems, and Kleinholz had been studying the endocrine control of retinal pigment movement in various shrimps and prawns. And he drew my attention to the fact that another American biologist, by the name of Frank Brown, had come up with an idea that Kleinholz and some of his colleagues thought was a very far-out idea, namely that in the crustaceans, the control of their colour change <coughs> might be mediated by hormones that were, in some cases, being produced actually in the central nervous system. Brown's work depended very much on extractions of parts of the nervous system and after making these extracts, injecting them into shrimps and finding changes in their colour due to the action of the injected substances on the chromatophores. Kleinholz suggested to me that I might try and disprove this work. So I set out to do this. But actually I found, in fact, Brown seemed to be quite right, which is a very salutary experience because I set out to disprove something and find myself doing exactly the opposite. This, of course, does happen in research sometimes, Jimmy, doesn't it? Oh, yes, it's frequently the case. One has to be aware of this and not start out with notions that are too firmly set in case they have to be changed. But your reference to the nervous system in an endocrine context reminds me that about the time I started in endocrinology in the 1930s, there was a terrific, not to say bitter, controversy going on in connection with a particular part of the pituitary gland namely the posterior lobe of the pituitary, because histologists had looked at this and found few or no secretory cells in it, and as we shall see in a minute, the traditional endocrine system consists largely of epithelial-type glands, that is, glands made of masses of cells which are secretory. But the posterior pituitary, which was known to contain hormones, had no obviously secretory cells in it, and the question was, where did the hormones come from? Quite soon after I started my research, it was shown beyond much doubt that in fact the hormones of the posterior lobe were made in nervous tissue in the brain and carried down into the posterior lobe for storage. So that it's a rather similar situation to your crustacean hormones, which are produced in the central nervous system and stored in the nerve terminals, isn't it? Yes, I think, in fact, to summarise this first stage of our talk, it might be worth taking a date, uh, shall we say the late 1930s, when we were both finishing in the university, and say that there were at that time really two trains of thought. There was the majority of the endocrinologists working on the endocrine system as an entity in itself, independent of the nervous system, or so it then appeared. And this was responsible for major areas of control of the body, mostly of a long-term kind, like growth and development. But at the same time, there were some interesting speculations that the nervous system might either be producing some hormones itself, or possibly be regulating the endocrine system in some as then ill-defined way. Now, I think before we proceed further, it might be a good idea if we get our ideas fairly straight on what we really mean by an endocrine tissue. How would you tackle that one, Jimmy? What would you call an endocrine tissue? The literal meaning of the word endocrine, of course, helps us a bit here, because it means secretion inwards into the blood, 
as opposed to secretion outwards into a duct. Thus endocrine tissues secrete into their own blood supply and their products then circulate throughout the entire body. As opposed to an exocrine gland which secretes into a duct like, for instance, a submaxillary gland. Yes, an endocrine organ secretes into the blood one or more chemicals which were called hormones by Starling in 1905. I believe that the word hormone comes from a Greek verb which means to urge on. And certainly this was an apt term in the early days, and to describe adrenaline for which it was coined, when most hormones seemed to be stimulatory. But things have changed a bit now, as we shall see, for hormones are now known that are inhibitory. It's probably simplest to say that endocrine organs are composed mainly of cells which function in a specific way to secrete highly active chemicals, and these circulate in the bloodstream, and each has certain specific effects on particular target organs. I think this will illustrate what we mean by endocrine organs, at least from the functional point of view. Could you, Francis, perhaps add to this definition by reference to structure? I find it very difficult, Jimmy, to define an endocrine organ in morphological terms. You made a definition in terms of whether it has a duct or not, and this is perfectly true. But when one gets a stage further, and one actually looks at the cells of an endocrine organ under, let's say, an electron microscope, it's not easy to distinguish between an endocrine organ and an exocrine organ, except possibly in those cases which are responsible for producing steroid hormones. Here one can point to certain features of ultrastructure, like the curious tubular mitochondria, and the big mass of smooth reticulum in the steroid-producing cells. And I think it would be probably fair to say that the only steroid-producing cells which are specialised for producing steroids in quantity are, in fact, end some endocrine organs. I think this is true, and it also illustrates the important general point in biology that nearly always one has to look at function as well as structure to separate different tissues from each other. Clearly, a function is tremendously important in endocrine systems. This is obvious from the fact that one of the favourite approaches of the endocrinologist is to remove the supposed endocrine organ and then see what happens. And having done that, to make an extract of the endocrine organ and inject it to see if this so-called replacement therapy restores the function. Or alternatively, you could graft the organ back again, couldn't you? This has been much used recently, and it's obviously a very suitable approach. It's a refinement of the injection procedure. The main point is that you must first be able to upset normal function and then restore it to demonstrate endocrine activity. Of course, you're quite right. Simply by looking at a tissue, you can get clues as to its function, but you can't elucidate its function entirely. As we were saying, the steroid-producing glands are more easily detectable than those endocrine tissues which produce peptide hormones, like, for example, the pituitary cells, because a pituitary cell, and shall we say the cell of the exocrine pancreas, really looks superficially remarkably similar under the electron microscope. They've both got a large endoplasmic reticulum, the products are packaged in a Golgi apparatus, and then eventually are stored in nice little discreet, round, membrane-bound vesicles. They really look very similar to one another. Very similar indeed. It might be interesting to mention at this point that before the days of the electron microscope, people stained endocrine tissues with a variety of dyes. These dyes were known to be nonspecific, but some of them were very useful. And the next of our slides shows a section through the pituitary of the South African clawed toad stained with some of these dyes. You will see that there are cells of three quite distinct colours in the section. Some are a clear lilac colour, and these are the cells concerned with stimulating the thyroid gland. Some are bright orange in colour, and these probably secrete growth hormone. The third type have obviously taken both the lilac dye and the orange dye, and look a sort of reddish-brown. These are the cells that stimulate the gonads to grow. So clearly, microscopy has its uses in studying endocrine tissues, even if it doesn't make it possible for us to make a cast-iron definition of an endocrine tissue on purely morphological grounds. In any case, I think, Jimmy, one should be wary of definitions. 
One might at this point draw attention to the motto of the Royal Society, which is nullius in verba, which I'm told very freely translated means there's no great virtue in words. One must remember when the Royal Society was founded in the 17th century, it was a time when science depended very much on authority and tradition. Somebody gave his views, and then somebody else said what he thought of the first person's views, and so on. And the founders of the society were very anxious that science should depend far more on observation and experiment, and not by heeding what was the traditional view. And so they were very wary of definitions. And I think we must agree they were dead right. For as we shall see in a moment, these definitions are sometimes very difficult to maintain. I think we'll find this when we come to the question of whether an endocrine tissue is innervated or not. What do you think about this, Jimmy? Are endocrine tissues innervated? In general, no. Although I know that in some endocrine organs, innervation has been demonstrated. Presumably, this innervation is a functional innervation, though I think, as you would be the first to admit, Francis, it might very well be that these nerves are actually going to the blood vessels of the gland rather than to its secretory cells. But you know more about this than I do. Well, certainly, sometimes you find fibres going into an endocrine gland and there are small blood vessels in the gland and it's quite likely that they're being innervated by the nerve fibres. And sometimes you can definitely show innervation. For instance, those islet cells, the islets of Langerhans cells in the pancreas. I remember Professor Lever of Cardiff showing some very beautiful electron micrographs demonstrating innervation by adrenergic nerve fibres, actually making synaptic contacts with the endocrine tissues. Another very clear case of innervation is the adrenal medulla. It's a very effective innervation because if the splanchnic nerves are stimulated, there's a release of adrenaline into the bloodstream. And of course, this, we know, mobilises the body for emergency by various effects like action on smooth muscle release of sugars into the blood and so on. But I think these are rather special cases. I think it would be more true, surely, to say that as a rule, endocrine tissues are not directly innervated. But, Francis, haven't you been responsible for showing in the electron microscope the very important and interesting case of double innervation of the pars intermedia in an animal that we're both interested in, namely the spotted dogfish? Well, yes, this is perfectly true, but we should perhaps make a distinction here, because when we talk to date about innovation, I think we've been using the term in the way that it's generally used, as for the innovation of end organs like muscles or other effector organs, usually by either cholinergic nerves or sometimes by adrenergic nerves. But in this case you've drawn attention to, namely the dogfish pars intermedia pituitary, and I should say that this double innovation has now been shown to extend right up into the mammals, shown very beautifully, for instance, in the ferret. This innovation is by a special class of nerves, perhaps we should call neural elements, which we call neurosecretory nerves. Now, these are rather different, for they store great quantities of relatively large molecules, unlike the cholinergic nerves. Some of the neurosecretory nerves store peptide molecules and have been called peptidergic. Others store amines and are called aminergic. These two types of neurosecretory fibres not only make contact with the pituitary pars intermedia in the dogfish, but in some other fishes, notably the bony fishes, they also make contact with cells of the pituitary pars distalis. And as we can see in this picture of the pituitary of the eel, the two systems really permeate the pituitary. And this is the important point, they provide an essential link between the nervous system and the endocrine system. But before we go into details of this neurosecretion, Jimmy, I'd rather like you to discuss a little bit more of your own work about the endocrine system as a delicately interlocking system in balance, to some extent independent of nervous control. I know you've done some work on amphibian development, and perhaps you'd like to say a few words about that. Yes, I did mention our work on Xenopus tadpole metamorphosis earlier, but actually there's been a tremendous lot of work done on the endocrinology of amphibian metamorphosis, and it illustrates one of the best examples of the action and integration of endocrine systems in the whole of the animal kingdom. For example, sometimes in our own work we get a hatch of tadpoles in which a few, perhaps eight or so in a thousand, lack thyroid glands,
and we've kept these congenitally athyroid larvae until they've reached a length of eight inches. But they remain tadpoles with no hind legs, no front limbs, and a huge tail. Thus, in the absence of the thyroid gland, no metamorphosis is possible. Now, it used to be thought a fairly simple situation in which only the thyroid glands were implicated, thyroxine, that is, the thyroid hormone, mediating the metamorphosis of all the tissues. As is well known, every tissue in the animal body undergoes some kind of change at metamorphosis, either disappearing by resorption or metamorphosing into a new structure which has a use in the adult, or undergoing biochemical changes. And without thyroxine, none of these things can happen. But in 1918, as long ago as that, American workers showed that if you take out the pituitary gland from a tadpole, this has much the same effect on metamorphosis as removal of the thyroid glands. This was another landmark in endocrine research, since it was the first demonstration of the interplay between the pituitary and the thyroid. I think, Francis, this is what you're hinting at when you talk of mutual interrelationships between the endocrine glands. I think what I'm really suggesting is that we can think of some of these endocrine organs, like the pituitary and thyroid, as being to some extent in balance by themselves, as distinct from the nervous system, by an interplay of their hormones acting on each other. For instance, would it be true to say the pituitary produces the thyroid-stimulating hormone, and once the thyroid has got stimulated, it then acts back on the pituitary again? And this is still widely accepted as one possible mechanism for the mutual interplay between thyroid and pituitary, and put simply, it would mean that the thyroid gland produces thyroxine, which enters the blood system and ultimately reaches the pituitary, so that this gland is made aware, so to speak, of the level of thyroid hormone in the blood. This process is called feedback. If, as the amount of thyroxine rises, the stimulating potency of the pituitary falls because of some kind of mechanism, which we don't understand at the moment, between thyroxine and the thyrotrophic cells of the pituitary, then this is called negative feedback, and it plays a very important role in the maintenance of what is called endocrine homeostasis. And without the intervention of the nervous system at all? This certainly appears to happen without the intervention of the nervous system, but it seems not to be the whole story. Because if you take the pituitary away from its contact with the brain and implant it into, say, the tail of a tadpole, then metamorphosis will virtually stop. Certainly none of the events associated with the metamorphic climax are possible. And this is generally believed to indicate that an intact connection between brain and pituitary is essential before the interrelationships known to exist between pituitary and thyroid can be established. Well, now we're getting back again to an influence of the nervous system. We seem to be unable to get away from it, don't we? If you remember, when we were first doing research in the 30s, it had been shown that the sex hormones interacted in some way with the pituitary, so that the pituitary stopped producing its follicle-stimulating hormones, and so no more eggs were produced, while the corpus luteum was increasing in size. In those days, one tended to think of this as a very simple procedure in which the level of one hormone in the blood directly affected another gland, like that negative feedback you were talking about. But as you say, the more we look into these endocrine interactions, the more the brain seems to play some sort of part. For example, as you said, take the pituitary away from its normal position, put it somewhere else where it survives, let's say the eye chamber or kidney capsule, for instance, it can still produce a certain amount of hormone, yet its complete normal function seems to stop. Evidently, contact with the brain is necessary for real proper pituitary action. And I think, Jimmy, in the next track we might see why this is so. Thank you, Professor Knowles and Professor Dodd.